This is the 23rd running of the Firecracker 400. On this super speedway, more than 60,000 people expected to come to take part in the fun today. Hello again, everybody. I'm Keith Jackson with Jackie Stewart. And Jackie, when you talk about the Firecracker 400, you think about heat, heat, heat. Got to be up around 125 degrees down on that racetrack. Well, it's on days like this, Keith, where I thank the good Lord that I'm a retired racing driver, that I'm not clambering into one of these hot boxes on a day like this. These good old boys are big and they're strong, and believe me, Keith, they have to be, because today on that racetrack, 400 miles around this super speedway, they've got to lose pounds and pounds of weight, maybe up to 10, 14 pounds, some of these big boys. Not pleasant. We'll see what happens. Let's get the wheels rolling now as we check in to NASCAR control. Get them underway. And so the rumble of power echoes off the starting lane as the starting field of 42 revs up to get ready to run the Firecracker 400 20 years ago. This was the premier season for ABC's Wide World of Sports, and this event was covered. And guess who was down along pit road? You're right, Chris Zagonamaki. The 50 lap distance on a tank of gas seems to be almost an impossibility today because of the very hot pace. We're opposite Freddie Lorenzen's pit. We talked to the crew chief, Ralph Moody, and he says he's going to bring him in uh, not later than 45 laps because uh, they just can't get a two-stop race out of it. This means we'll have more pit action before the race is over. Now they're coming down here, and this is almost murder. Nothing much has really changed. It's still hot, as noted. Chris may have lost a little weight. His wardrobe is a little better, and he no longer is allowed to stand in pit road and direct traffic. But he's still reporting, and he's still the best. Well, about the only thing that hasn't changed in the 20 years since I first held a television microphone in my hand is the temperature. In 1961, there was Indianapolis, Daytona, and Darlington. And now, major speedways crisscross the nation. It's become a big sport. It has respect. Millionaire sportsmen put their name on cars with the pure sport of it, with no thought of financial return. In 1961, David Pierce won this race and took home $8,500. Today, the winner will pocket about $30,000. And that year, the prize money was $717,000. This year, the contestants are looking at $7 million. And in the area of safety, the T-shirts have been replaced by fireproof uniforms. The cars are refueled with aircraft systems rather than funnels and buckets. And the cars are very crashworthy. Drivers walk away from spectacular accidents. In 1961, the speed was 157 miles an hour for the ball. Today, it's 40 miles an hour faster than 197 miles an hour. The growth has been tremendous, due in part to acceptance by the press and in television. Actually, the last 20 years has been great for automobile racing and this reporter. All right, Christopher, now let's set the starting grid for you as we look at the Grand National point stand. You can see Bobby Allison has a 256-point lead over Darrell Waltrip, and looking down through the 10th place, you can see a lot of new names are beginning to show up. And now, an old name, fellow we've watched for so many years and been so thrilled by his performance, Cale Yarborough, back on the pole again at 192.8. Harry Gant is outside in row number one. In row number two, Dale Earnhardt, who is yet to win a race this year. He won the national point title last year. Bobby Allison's outside in row number two. Look out for him. He's going steady. Kerry Labonte is in row three inside, and Richard Childress will start outside in row three today. Ron Bouchard, one of the rookies, inside row four. Another rookie, Rick Wilson, is outside. In row five, Johnny Rutherford in car number 98, and Kyle Petty, son of Richard, outside row five. Looking to row six now, inside, Neil Bonnet, car number 21, Ricky Rudd, a youngster who's improving greatly. Row number seven, A.J. Foyt inside, Richard Petty outside, and look for some moves by those two early. Looking to the rest of the starting field, row eight, it's Alexander and Lenny Pond. Row number nine, Bill Ellswick and Timmy Richmond. Row 10, Darrell Waltrip, look out for him. He'll make an early move. Looking to row number 11 and 12, there's Buddy Baker. He'll make some early moves, too. He finally got his act together. Benny Parsons back in row number 13, along with Bill Elliott. 14, 15, 16, Stan Barrett, the man who broke the sound barrier on the ground. Cecil Gordon, a veteran there. Looking at the next group of rows, it's 17, 18, 19. Dave Marcus way back in the stack in 19. And at the tail end of it, row 20 and 21, Morgan Shepard leading among the rookies, James Hilton and Tommy Houston. At it, we will start 42 cars. 
working their way through turns three and four now anticipating green on the start Cale Yarborough the pole setter at one nine two eight five to repeat that number for you there's a lot of speed up front the first five rows qualifying at better than 190 miles an hour Bobby Allison won his first firecracker 400 a year ago he in effect is the defending champion trying this year to win his first Grand National Points Championship NASCAR control now reading the field to see if I they're in the proper perspective if they are They'll give him the green. The pace car is out of the way. The black man is Harold Kinder. He has the green in his hand. We've got a start. The 1981 Firecracker 400 with Yarborough and Gant going side by side into the first turn and the first move of the race comes from Darrell Waltrip. See him pull out of the pack and duck in ahead of about four automobiles. But moving up into the front, and taking the lead coming down off the first turn is Cale Yarborough with Harry Gant right there. And Dale Earnhardt, who was your points champion a year ago, is in the number three position with Allison right there. Earnhardt is yet to win a race this year. And so far, they are very much in order. And this is a place where discipline is absolutely required, Jackie Stewart. Any nonsense at this part of the racetrack when the cars are so closely patched together could really cause a major problem. One driver would just be into another right away. But in fact, Harry Gant, the man leading the field right now in the car number 33, as they come into the dry over here, and it looks like he's been beaten out by Dale Earnhardt. He's got in the car number two, the blue and white car there, and Harry Gant tucked in behind him as they go into this high banking here. It's a two and a half mile oval here. It's a tri oval. The blue and yellow car there, number two, that Dale Earnhardt leading the race. Harry Gant, the green and white car behind him, coming off the 31 degrees of banking, getting down this long 3,000 feet of straight stretch in the back stretch and Harry Gant's making for it. Keep going into turn three. Harry Grant takes a lead. Gant has a history of second place. In case you don't know about it, he has finished second four times in 1981, three times in 1980, and he is so hungry to win something. Earnhardt, who had such a big year a year ago, winning more than a half a million dollars, has eased into the lead as he slides on by. And here comes Cale Yarborough, picking up the draft and going with him. The short car, the draft, has become so important here. They're down to 110-inch wheelbase now, and it has made this whole scheme of racing in Grand National Competition kind of precious because the cars react more readily. And here's Bobby Allison in car number 28, the orange and white car coming up to take the lead. He's going to get it. Bobby Allison, a great favorite down here with the crowd. A man, of course, defending champion of the Firecracker 400. He's high on this 31 degree of banking, both ends of the speedway. As they come back down onto the straight stretch here, it's a dog leg going past the, the start finishing line, and here they come to it. Allison sitting right there with Gant battling for first place. We'll be back with more in a moment. As we resume our coverage of the Firecracker 400, Harry Gant has the lead with Dale Earnhardt, number two, moving into second place, and Bobby Allison dropping back to third with Cale Yarborough running four, and now Earnhardt slingshot and goes whistling past Gant and goes into the lead and takes two others with him. And Harry Gant goes from the lead to first position right back to fourth without backing an island. Amazing. That's what happens to a NASCAR. Still no incident in the race. They continue to run at a very heavy pace. And Bobby Allison now comes out of the slipstream and goes into the lead. They keep switching it back and forth and looking back over the statistics for 1981. There have been a remarkable number of lead changes during the course of the racing of 1981. And one of the reasons, I suppose, has to do with the wheelbase of the car. Five inches shorter, plus the fact that two inches narrower. The cars are considerably more nervous. They're more highly strung. In fact, there's been a lot more spin-outs in yellow flags due to incidents in 1981 than there was a year ago because the long chassis car is a lot easier to handle. But look at that snake. All just these cars strung out together there as if they were really connected. And look at that. There's Earnhardt high on the racetrack. They're going to be three abreast as they go down that stretch towards turn one again. Trust is a very important factor in this kind of racing. You've got to be able to trust the man that you're running in front of, behind, alongside at 180 or 90 miles an hour. You've got to believe in his skill and his ability to control his machine. 
Neil Bonnet in the Woods Brothers car, number 21, running right up among the leaders as we work our way around the hazy day at Daytona International Speedway. You can identify Hale Yarmour by that V that's on the hood. That is the most uh, identifying factor about his car. And uh, he is some kind of a bulldog when he sits up among the leaders. Always has been. Strong man, very athletic looking. He's chunky. He's not a man of lean features, but he's certainly very, very fast. And there's Harry Gant goes underneath him there. Car number 33, the green and white one. Still in the lead there. Just took it just a few seconds ago. Dale Earnhardt in the yellow and blue car in third position. And Bobby Allison in the orange and white car tailing in fourth position behind that. Harry Gant going down the long 3,000 foot back straight here. Two and a half a miles around this tri-oval going in now to the 31 degree of banking. You can't climb up there, but going in all fours really to get up that steep banking. And these cars go around it glued to the road surface. And if you do something wrong, they become unglued very quickly. And we have a broad engine. And he pulled right in front here of Kyle Petty in the blue and red car there. That could have been an incident. Apparently no oil came out of his car. Oftentimes when you see that puff of smoke, there will be a patch of oil dropped onto the racetrack. It brings out the yellow flag. They want to make sure this is the first untoward moment we have had in the race, and it's Wilson, number 62, dropping down off the running surface onto the active road and getting out of the way. So that's good thinking on his part. So Wilson getting out of the traffic, the yellow slows him down. Remember in NASCAR Grand National Racing, under the yellow flag, they close up. So some of those hot runners back in the pack are gonna be able to close in on the leaders. We pick up coverage of the Firecracker 400 now, getting the green flag after the yellow, and we have a new leader. It's young Mike Alexander. Alexander out of Franklin, Tennessee, being followed closely by Richard Petty. Obviously, during the yellow, everybody ducked into the pit area, taking on tires and gasoline, but Alexander did not. That's why he is in the lead at this point of this race. And what a thrill. And there's another car, Tommy Houston, car number 17. He's blowing oil, but there's no yellow flag. It must be OK. The, the track must be in good condition, so that's fine. But for young Mike Alexander, what a thrill, Keith, to be leading the Firecracker 400. What's more to be ahead of King Richard Petty? That must be a thrill for this young man. Same kid that was standing yesterday trying to glean information, <laughs> looking for information out of the wisdom of Petty, then going to Bobby Allison, going to all the guys who have had so much success here eager to learn well he's learning but right now he's just being passed by king richard himself and with him is buddy baker in the red car there car number one tucked in behind king richard betty he's come from 21st starting position that's pretty impressive that's a long way up and he's now in second position buddy baker rattled his car off turn three's wall on thursday looked like he wouldn't even get in the race then came back on the second day to qualify on Friday, and here he is having qualified at 190 and right back up there running with the big boys. And this big old lanky guy from Charlotte is a competitor. Been around a long time and had a lot of success. And right now, when you look down on the racetrack and you see Petty and Baker, it can take you back 10 years or more. Well, King Richard Petty, a man who I admire tremendously, a man who captures the imagination of the public as a race driver, represents the sport so well, has great dignity about him, great presence. He is a star. People look at Richard Petty and somehow he's built up this great charisma that exists today and, and totally justified it is because 10 times he's won at this great speedway, whether it be 500 mile races or 400 mile races and Buddy Baker now slips past and Buddy Baker Baker takes it going in to turn three. Buddy now at 40 years of age, big fella, 6'5", 215 or so pounds, and Hoss Ellington, who owns that car, has got to be jumping up and down right now because it was a fingernail act to get it into the race, and there he sits, leading Petty in the firecracker. Alexander is hanging on. Johnny Rutherford still went up there amongst the front runners. Cale Yarborough now is sitting in the number five position. Ricky Rudd is running in about the number six position. And Labonte, in car number 44, is running number seven. Right now, it looks solid with Baker and Petty going one, two. Well, Buddy Baker now making himself in front of a very large crowd here in a very hot day. The seating capacity here at this great Daytona International Speedway is 75,000 seats. Quite impressive. 
not all filled today. It's very hot, very humid here. We've got a car on the wall, car number 88. That's Ricky Rudd, is on the wall, coming out of turn four. Benny Parsons in a melee. Elliot's involved in it. Harvey's involved in it. Ellison takes to the grass to get away from it. But what a wallop by Ricky Rudd as he crashed into the wall. That's Benny Parsons coasting to a stop down on the infield. And car number 11, Daryl Waltrip, hit the wall, and he stopped for the moment. And obviously, the yellow flag is out. Well, that was certainly a hard impact. The cars would be doing oh, no less than 180 miles an hour when that happened. Ricky Rudd's moving around. We can see from our commentary position here, and we can see some movement on our monitor also. Ricky Rudd's okay. The protection offered to those race drivers, really impressive and really amazing. There's another driver there. That's Billy Harvey there. He seems to be okay. Ricky scrambles out. These cars, of course, the doors all welded up. You can't open doors on them. Crowd responding to Rudd's appearance. Betty Parsons is out walking around, surveying the damage, and not terribly happy about the circumstance, I'm sure. Well, I don't think he was even part of that. It was just an incident that happened up front there, and when that happens at that speed, there's very little a race driver can do. There's a lot of tire smoke there. You can't see through it. Ricky Rudd, perfectly conditioned, and then you see, that's Harvey. He's okay. Who else is that? Bill there's Elliott. A, Bill Elliott there, too, a race driver there. Here's Harvey. So they're all apparently going to walk away from the scrap iron, but we did have a considerable melee, and we'll take another look at it. Well, this kerfuffle started well back there, two, four, six cars back, that cluster of three cars there, and you see Ricky Rudd driving inside there. It looks like he came in contact with the car behind him. It looks like it might have been Johnny Rutherford there, and right there you can see the car immediately shedding an enormous amount of sheet metal. It looks like the rear end was quite badly damaged. Then the car spins into the wall. Now look at the action behind here. These two cars kiss, and then you see the cars coming up here. That's Benny Parsons. Dale Earnhardt was in there as well. Denny Benny Parsons, car number 15, get out of shot there a little bit. And another angle, and you and see Benny it again. Parsons. That car rubbing itself to oh, destruction along this concrete wall that goes right around the two and a half miles. There you see the contact with Benny Parsons down below there. Then Benny starts to come up here. Dale Earnhardt as well, he's involved. Benny Parsons' car slams straight into the wall there. Tremendous damage, and yet these drivers very well protected. Actually, incredible that no more were involved than we had because of all the smoke obscuring the vision. But it was quite a wallop by Ricky Rudd. And Chris Economaki has him right now. First car involved was that. You all right, Ricky? Yeah. How did it begin? I don't know. I, I was passing Rutherford. I got by him and, and cleared him. Next thing I know, I uh, was coming back out against the wall. Somebody hit me in the back bumper. I don't know who it was. What, what's it like in the car when one of those jarring crashes? Is it tough on the body? No, it's just, you know, uh, it's just a shame you got to tear all that good equipment up for somebody making a, you know, a stupid mistake, really. Uh, it's far it happens so quick and it's over so quick, you don't have time to think about it. Don't have you thinking about as cars coming down the racetrack and maybe getting into you, but I'm just uh, upset to where I had to race so early. But at least he's all right. Everybody walks away, but at least three of those cars involved are out of the race. We'll be back. Waiting now for NASCAR control to indicate green so we can go back to racing in the Firecracker 400. We've got green, and Harry Gant bolts out of the pack and goes into the lead. In car number 70, J.D. McDuffie is in second place. Car number 90, that's Jody Ridley out of Chatsworth, Georgia, is up in third place. Obviously, again, you had a great deal of shuffling amongst your leaders because of the pit stops they made. Bobby Allison is sitting up in the number four position, and Neil Bonnet, part of that Alabama gang, is right with him. Car number 99, Kevin Houseby out of Des Moines, Iowa, is also right now up among the leaders. There's a man you want to keep your eye on all the time, Donnie, uh, uh, Bobby Allison. Incidentally, Donnie Allison, who was injured severely at the World 600 in Charlotte some six weeks ago, is out of hospital. He is down at the family farm and moving along quite well in his recuperation. Donnie was a winner here in the Firecracker 400 back in 1970. Oh, long time, good friend of mine, and uh, I'm sure all of us here at ABC Sports wish him the very best. And you know what? They're even talking about that tough guy coming back to racing in the early weeks of August. So they are resilient, aren't they? Well, it's very nice to hear that he's recovering so well. We all wish him well. And look at right now, Brother Bobby keeping the family honors up there. And right behind him, a protege of both Donnie and Bobby Allison. And that there man there driving the Wood Brothers car. 
He's one of the men, one of the young drivers that's been brought along over so many years. And this is what is interesting from my point of view. A driver can be taught so much in stock car racing. And when you have the Allison brothers to teach you, that certainly is a big help. The name, of course, is Neil Bonnet. And the guys that are handling this car, putting it together and sending it out on the racetrack to run aren't too bad either. Fellas called the Woods Brothers. They're closing down the distance now on the leader, Harry Gant. This matter of drafting, it's a matter of aerodynamics. And for those of you who are not quite familiar with it, the fellow in front, of course, is opening a path for the following car. But at the same time, Bobby Allison, in this instance, is getting a push from Neil Bonnet. And they move up alongside and go whistling right on by Harry Gant. So that's what the aerodynamics of the drafting process can do for you. It gives you that additional thrust. And when you are ready, you pull it out, let it go, and most of the time, it will be successful for you. But again, the element of trust comes into play because you are so close together. Just inches apart, and right there, they're almost glued bumper to bumper there. Neil Bonnet really tucked in behind Bobby Allison, and of course, they have that trust that you speak of. It can't be that any driver takes any sharp or fast movements. He's got to be very precise. He's got to do everything with a, a, a degree of warning. Somehow or other, there's a sixth sense in many good racing drivers. And look how close they are there. And they're doing no less than probably 180, 190 miles an hour. Precision driving. It's almost again like formation flying at high speed. There is a gap between these three front runners and the rest of the field. But I should give you the name of the man who is sitting in the number four spot. You recognize him. He's that big old tough Texan A.J. Foyt sitting right in there in the number four position with a considerable gap between third and fourth. Young Tim Richmond is sitting in there in the number five position right now. Bobby Allison and Neil Bonnet running one two with Harry Gant sitting in the number three position and now the Petties have begun to make a move up through the ranks. That's the father and son. Kyle the son and of course Richard the daddy and tucked right in between them. Uh, I think you'll see J.D. McDuffie is sitting in between the two petties but it's something to see father and son out there running at this kind of a pace. We talked at the very beginning of today's program about the oppressive heat of July 4 at Daytona. Here's Chris. Temperature right now is 101 degrees here at Daytona and you can see the fans are seeking the shade. One of your tire engineers tell me that the temperature of the asphalt is 145 degrees. It's certainly a hot 4th of July in Daytona. Can you imagine 140 degrees? Here is Bonnet going for the lead, and he slips past Bobby Allison. And he takes Harry Gant with him. So again, we see the aerodynamics of slingshotting at work. And we've got uh, Jody Ridley there, car number 90, he's dropping oil, it looks like it coming out the back there, certainly smoke, he's coming out of the fast lane, down onto the hard shoulder here, trying to get away from the groove to try and save any drivers from getting into trouble. He's pulling into what looks like pit lane, there's car gone off behind him, he's got his Bill Ellswick, he's, he's, he's all over the place, he's going to miss the barrier, but oh! Just at the last minute, the car kicked back in there, seemed to get a bit of grip, slammed into the barrier. He's now in pit lane, and he's trying to get the car restarted, trying to get it in motion again, but that was a pretty severe piece of contact. Car number 75 there. We're going to see this replayed again here in slow motion. You, you see the car there in front now. You see him smoking. We saw, obviously, he was dropping oil, and back up in the corner, you can see the contact of Ellswick's car with the oil, and from that point on, it would just hang on. And the car goes over the grass here, but look right here, it leaps into the air almost, comes back down, looks as if it's going to slide past the barrier. At the last minute, it seems to, look, just dig into the, the grip there on that grass, slams itself into the barrier there. That accident for him started plus 180 miles an hour, probably had impact with that barrier there, probably still doing 40 miles an hour, strong, strong bang in the back end. But he's back on a racetrack. Isn't, isn't well that amazing? You know, your cars are really built pretty hard. <laughs> Yarborough is in the pits. Everybody ducks in for more fuel, for fresh rubber, particularly on the right side. And Yarborough gets a very efficient pit stop, trailing some fuel. He's off and running again. The yellow flag is up. They've got to do some mopping up, soak up that oil coming down off turn numbers three and four. The first dropping of oil, I think, occurred between turns three and four. 
So the yellow laps will count and they'll mop it up and we'll be back. The yellow flag is still out. They're mopping up the oil that fell out of uh, Ridley's car and also cleaning up the debris from the crash of Ellswick into the barrier. Ellswick is back on the racetrack, and obviously this is not a pure stock car. You can't go down and buy one. They have been reinforced considerably, and he's back out there and running again. And we'll be back later for the finish of the Firecracker 400. But right now, let's join Bill Fleming in Birmingham, England for World Cup Show Jumping. ABC's Wide World of Sports resumes its coverage of the Firecracker 400 of 1981 at the Daytona International Speedway. We are anticipating a green flag for the field, NASCAR Grand National Stock Car Racing. Uh, about 30. That's NASCAR control, waiting for a green flag. Come on, Staley, let's go to the house. See how orderly they are. We'll get a call. Okay, Harold, you got it. Okay, that means Green is out, and here we go racing under Green again. Keith Jackson, Jackie Stewart, and Chris Economaki on a very, very July, hot July 4th at Daytona. Chris Economaki told us earlier the temperature was over 100 degrees for humanity milling around in the pit area, and 140 degrees on the racetrack, and Richard Petty runs first, Buddy Baker runs second. King Richard Petty, the bright blue and red car there as the other red car challenges him for the lead and that's big Buddy Baker car number one. He's taking the lead here at Daytona and that's Kyle Yabra coming in behind him and they go three abreast. Now they narrow it down to two lanes and these two cars side by side in the 31 degree banking here of Daytona. It looks like Kyle Yabra and the lighter colored car there, the white, black and red car has the advantage as they come into this dog leg of the start finishing line. It's a try over 18 degrees of banking right here. And the Petty, Richard, car number 43 is running in the number four spot. Son Kyle in car number 42, they look alike, running number five. So that's quite something to see as the years have been tumbling by, haven't they? And they've been collecting the dollars as they've gone along. Four million dollars plus for King Richard Petty in his career, car number 43. Well, that may not be the world of money for you Americans, but for a wee Scotsman, it's an <laughs> awful lot. There is another youngster settling right in amongst them, too. In car number 12, his name is Tim Richmond. He's out of Ashland, Ohio. And he seems to be one of those young chargers that's going to make a place for himself in this business of motor racing. He certainly done very well. He did well up in the Indianapolis Motor Speedway last year. He was the Rookie of the Year, and he's certainly doing well. But right now, it's the old brigade that are up there, the old faithfuls, the men you normally see leading the race. And the car number 27, Kale Yarbrough from Timmonsville, the man who was in pole position here, he's still got the lead. The man behind him, Buddy Baker, in the red car came from 21st position on the starting grid. Certainly done very well. He won at Daytona here. In fact, he won the fastest ever 500-mile race here. He averaged more than 177 miles an hour on the only occasion that he's won at this super speedway. And if you are wondering what in the world has happened to Bobby Allison, well, he's out of the race. Apparently, a cracked cylinder head took him out as he came into the pits started his car and water and oil and smoke billowed out and that was it. It was on to the garage. So Bobby Allison is gone. But Cale Yarborough seems to be sitting inside a car that's got plenty of muscle on this hot day. And he seems to be all over the racetrack. He more or less goes where he wants to go. He seems to start the banking fairly low, gets right up and then comes back down again. Richard Petty making a move for second position in car number 43. He's trying to go for it. Harry Gant's right behind him, and he, Gant running up alongside of Baker, should be able to duck into third. Incidentally, Tim Richmond, who was up in that number three spot just moments ago, has been running outside of the chain. Now he ducks back in, but not before he had lost four spots. He got out there by himself, lost the impact of the draft, and just bing, 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 lost four spots. Harry Gant moving past Richard Petty. He's still hanging in there, hanging on and running hard. But right now, the most impressive racing machine out on that racetrack to me is the one being driven by Cale Yarborough. And if it holds together, he'll be a horse to catch. Here goes Harry Gant. 
slingshotting Cale Yarborough and Gant goes back into the lead and we have had dozens of lead changes so far today. We'll be back with more. You're looking at Harry Gant driving car number 33 and leading the Firecracker 400. Cale Yarborough in car number 27 is running right behind him. Car number 43, Richard Petty, is in the number three position. And so far in the race, we have had 34 lead changes. That's impressive. I think that's one of the things. The crowd keep coming back down here to see the Southern boys drive these oval racetracks. NASCAR racing gives really the best value for money in motorsport anywhere in the world for the spectators. And it's coming up to the end of a race like this where you see the tremendous challenge for the drivers and the crowd never leave until that check and flag. Harry Gant running in first place was part of the rookie crop of 1979 that gave us the Bunty and the uh, so many other fine young drivers he really is the one who would be short on experience among these front runners because Yale Cale Yarborough has been around so long Richard Petty's history you well know Buddy Baker is running in the number four spot there's all the cunning and guile that you could ever hope to find in Grand National Racing in those three people Yarborough Baker and Petty so now it's a question whether or not Harry Gant has the experience to hang on to what he owns right now, first place. And it's not just a question of age, because Harry Gant's 41 years of age, and that certainly is no young man when it comes to motor racing. Tim Richmond's back there in fifth position, and of course, he's a much younger person. Harry Gant has the maturity of age, but whether he has the experience of being out there in the lead and being able to actually button down a victory is another thing. I remember myself when I was almost winning races, it was just one big difference, actually getting up and winning that checkered flag race it's just that little bit of difference it doesn't seem to make a big difference at the time but my my doesn't it make a big difference with the head at car number five that the leaders were passing just there driven by morgan shepherd he is the leader in the rookie points chase for 1981 and he is literally the fellow that tim richmond is chasing right now looking for rookie honors and that is a big honor it helps you a little bit in the cash department the following year and certainly adds tremendously to your prestige. But right now, we've got wise old heads jousting around, looking for the place, pacing themselves, feeling of the car. Is it loose? Is it right? Can I do this? Do I have enough horsepower to blow him away? Should I sit here and wait the slingshot? Shall I do this now, or shall I wait for another lap? Or in the case of Yarborough here, you almost get the feeling that Cale is sitting there just so that he shows up big in Harry Gant's mirror because Harry certainly knows that he's there. He also knows that Richard Petty is back in third place, though there is a considerable gap right now. You might think that Richard would be out of it. Not so. We'll be back. It's now in sight for this running in the Firecracker 400. It continues to be Harry Gant and Cale Yarborough running 1-2 with Richard Petty right now, a distant third, and car number 12 smoking. Tim Richmond apparently making a bold bid for a, a piece of the cake at the end of the rainbow is going to go out of it. Looks like he has blown something in his car, dropping down off the running surface, and looks like young Richmond is gone. And he was running in the number six position at the time, which is very good. Well, very disappointing for him. So high in such an important race in the super speedway. But right now, Richard Petty has closed that gap up. Harry Gant still leading Kiel Yabra in the center of that sandwich there. But the blue and red car that just went out of your picture is Richard Petty. Very close to them now and within reach. We have seen on this racetrack before a man come down off turn three and four, slingshot, and get a win. Do you think this is what Cale Yarborough has in mind? I think this racetrack is changing over these years. The cars are getting fast. The aerodynamics are changing a little bit. And the space between the exit of turn four and the start finishing line on this dog leg seems to be shortening every year. It seems now that the best place to pass is to before getting into three and four. Whether that's going to happen here is another thing. But if there's one man thinking a lot about how to do that right now, it must be Cale Yarborough. Richard Petty is within range also. So, but Harry Gant's the man in the bubble. Very difficult for him to know what to do. Although he's won many other races, this would be his first super speedway victory in front of such a crowd and in front of such company. It's a game of 
mental and emotional gymnastics right now. Because Yarborough surely has made up his mind what he will do, and probably has made up his mind when he will do it. Harry Gant has to play the guessing game the other way, trying to outguess Yarborough. Does Gant have enough horsepower to pull away, to tuck away from Yarborough the effect of the draft? Can Richard Petty pull in closer so he can be part of a three-car draft? It does not appear that Petty has the horsepower to close down on them right now. And they're using every part of the racetrack here. Harry Gant was very low on that racetrack as they go into turn three right now. It does seem to me that it's Kale Yarbrough who's the man who's in the position to do it. They're coming up after they come out of this turn four that they're on to right now. We're only one lap to go as they come up to the lower commentary position here and go across the line that you can see the white flag has been given to him. Harry Gant, 41 years of age, from Taylorville, North Carolina. Cale Yarborough, 41 years of age, from Timminsville, South Carolina, from Sardis. And Richard Petty, 44 years of age, from Randleman, North Carolina. They've all been on a lot of racetracks a lot of times, under a lot of different conditions. The prize money breakdown's got to be close to $25,000. And here goes Yarborough! He's going for it underneath, going into turn three. He's got underneath the car. Can, maybe Harry Gant can draft him again. He's in the slipstream right now, but Harry Gant's come out of the slipstream because he's up at the top. The crowd is absolutely in their toes to come to the finishing line. Keith. It is Kale Yarborough winning his fourth firecracker. The sixth victory for him on the Daytona International Speedway. So it was in Kale Yarborough's mind where to make his move, and he made it going into turn number three, and he did it just as slick as you can do it. And here we have a replay of this. He's in the middle of the racetrack, Harry Gant, car number 33, and here Kale Yarborough really takes advantage of the draft there. He comes low on the racetrack. They go in side by side into turn three, into these 31 degrees of banking. Kale Yarborough's car all day has been able to go in different lines around this racetrack. And right there, you see him going very high, almost to the outside line there, close to the wall. Harry Gant is not in the draft at this time. And right now, it very much is within everybody's knowledge that it was his race. The fifth time in 1981, Harry Gant has finished second. The winner, Cale Yarborough. Here's Chris. And here's the winner, Cale Yarborough. Congratulations, Cale. Lean against the car. If you're as tired as I am, you're tired out. Well, yeah, I am I'm tired, uh, Chris, but, you know, first thing is thank the Lord for a safe race. It was a fast one, I'm telling you. We had to run all day just as hard as we could run. And uh, I had to use strategy there at the end on Harry Gant. He was strong. And I, could I hated that. to sit behind him now for the last 30-some laps, but I knew if I didn't, he'd beat me. So I just had to use it on him. Cale, you had tremendous patience during that period of time. What were you thinking of sitting there? Were you sure you could pass him at the end? Well, my car had gotten a little bit loose, Chris, on the uh, on the last uh, stop, on the last uh, four-tire change. And uh, I just hoped, I knew I had to go in and turn number three wide open when I made my bid on the last lap, and I didn't know whether it was going to stick or not, but I had to try it, and thank goodness it did. Soaking wet, Kale. It's hot. Firecracker 400. <laughs>